Okay. <coughs> so I've muted the sound. Um, so we'll, we'll get into this later today. All right, so biogra biogeography and phylogeography. So we want to learn learning goals for today. Learn about continental drift, learn about dispersal and discariance, learn about some major biogeographic biogeographic events, uh, touch on phylogeography, why we need it, um, learn about some of the perils of methods. So a lot of you are going to become empirical scientists. I want to make you be afraid of bad methods. I'm going to show one that's very popular. And finally talk about some of the uses of phylogeography. Any questions? Okay. Okay, so Alfred Wegener, as the song goes. So, Proposed kind of the drift was the idea of Pangea. Right? Reaction of Wegener's theory was almost universally hostile and often exceptionally harsh and scathing. Right? How it felt was he had no printing mechanism. Flaws in his data made him um, make some incorrect and outrageous predictions. Um, more scarce work after his death, the majority of the was being in static continents and land bridges. Okay. So, how do things disperse from one continent to another? They end up here, there's a little you know, bridge. Okay. Um, <coughs> and then it's not true. Okay? And so Prax <coughs> evidence was geomagnetism. So who knows anything about this? So we're making new crust, right? New lens of bridge, spreading. But if you look at the magnetic field, like the so when rocks crystallize, you know, um, uh, crystals respond to magnetic fields. So you can see which way the you know, magnetic field was, was directly pointed in the form, right? And so now we know north is you know up towards Canada, right? Maybe that north is up towards Canada. Well, throughout the Earth's history, actually, it's flipped back and forth. Even today, the next field is weakening a little bit. So it's going to be flipped soon, or it's going to flip you know, some time from now. But when it's flipped, so if you have the sequence of spread of the conveyor belt out to here, then we'll see north is north, and north is south, and north is north, and it's staying on both sides. Okay. So it's consistent with the idea that C4 is coming up and moving apart, right? And so here, during this period, it's splitting north. And then flips, now it's pointing south, and pointing north. Okay. And so it's really good evidence for continental drift. The clocks. <coughs> and actually, we can do actually direct measurements of you know, how, how the things are spreading <coughs> apart. Okay. And there's lots more evidence now for this, too. And so plate tectonics. Okay. There are oceanic plates and continental plates. So moving around. Well, you do three things. You can slide past each other. Okay? And so you get stuck and you reduce that pressure. That's the quick. Um, so you can pull them apart. You can it. So you can have a construction zone. So when they hit, you can go under the pen top. Okay? And so here we see, you know, it's like a regular plate apart. There's some subduction. Right? And you get wrinkles in the plate above. And Um, and also you have, I uh, I think we also have, like this, we have, uh, okay. and you have separately cut from Okay, and so this is still, <coughs> what we think of today, because we're working on figuring out why it keeps moving with the convection force of heat, so, yeah. Why does... I don't know. Um, we know like the Rift Valley is spreading. I'm not sure if it's the same process. Yeah. <coughs> 
Oh, right. Yep. Thank you. That's good. Well, other questions about this? Yeah, we'll see. This is really affected life too. Okay. So, how do we find evidence for this on a tree? Right? How does biogeography occur on the phylogeny? Okay. And imagine we have one piece here, and then this water barrier, and then we have a one. What's that called? What's that process? Yep, authentic speciation. Good. Right. And this is going happen again. Okay. And then I have my non barrier, same thing here. Okay. And now you have a can of dispersal. So that's just going to flip between the parents and dispersal. The parents is you dividing things, and then it splits, and now you have to go from one to the other way. Okay. And there have been religious, religious wars in biogeography about this too. It's all that, is it all the carrions or not? So we have religious wars in phylogenetics, right? Um, of course, in practice, it's both. Right. So we know <coughs> there is dispersal of these. And so we see this happening in the tree. Now, one thing to think about is when this first in this line first splits, it can still be on both sides. And it's possible that when it's not going to appear, when it's going to be the case, it will have something else in the tree that's on both sides. So it's possible to first things to be in more than one area. Right? Again, those are in both North and South America. There's some that are only in North America, only in South America. Okay. Um, this is for other things, or other traits where things, you know, you need to have eyes, you don't have eyes. You don't have, have eyes and not have eyes. Right. Like, this cat wearing a blind thing. <coughs> with this sort of thing, you can be in one region, two regions, multiple regions. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, this is a plot of an algorithm um, called the Dispersive Repairs Analysis, or DIVA. It's a, it's a happening for it. And this is a very simple, parsimony based way of trying to try minimize the number of changes. Okay. Um, we're going to go through and back to it. Um, Any questions about this? Okay. So <coughs> here we have just showing the of the continent. So the Triassic. Okay. You can recognize where you are. Early Jurassic. <coughs> Early Cretaceous. KT boundary. I start to see things forming up, right? And of course, you know about that. Okay? And so forth. And so things to watch. So this history of you know southern continents and the northern continents, mm -hmm. right? And now, I'll show you off by itself. Let's see off by itself like this. Not to South America, but as I say, as I'll show you. So, let's take a picture of the group and look at how, how we can further biogeography. All right, so these are ring tailed leaders. And they live in Madagascar. And so here is where Madagascar has been through time. Okay. So, the middle of this discussion, and then here, okay. 
media. So, so, so we typically don't see much related to Indian ones than to African ones, right? Because they've shared. And so what you can do is you can go and figure out when this was evolved. Okay? And <coughs> this evolved after what's been connected to the first event. Well, before it could have been the parents. Could still, could still be this dispersal. <coughs> okay. Here's an example of um, a great invention by the Australians is American uh, biological change. Okay? So imagine if Australia you know, took a turn and sailed into California. Like, what would happen next? I mean, what do you think would happen with evolution? What? Gene Slav, you know what? Mm -hmm. Right, so we'd have it was migrating. It's not clear whether there be actually whether there's any species where they could actually interbreed. So I can feel that way. There's only species going from one to the other. Right? What else happen? Well, look at this scenario. Yeah. So imagine if Australia touched California. What would happen then? So we'd have animals going from one place to the other. What else? Did they all do it really well? Mm -hmm. Make a good dispersal, and that leads to more speciation. Good. What happens when things get introduced to Australia? So, what happens when we introduce, say, rabbits to Australia? So, you know, one famous example of invasive species wreaking havoc is we will introduce rabbits in Australia, right? They went over and you know, carrying off the vegetation. What? Right. And so that might happen in this case. You have other things that go through and invasive species might get picked out. Might be less likely because also the predators are also here. So you introduce rabbits, but also introduce foxes and introduce legs and everything else. Okay. But <coughs> we can see these, you know. It would be a great interchange against great mixing of things, okay, and with the various ecological consequences. Well, this experiment has been done before. So, we had South America, South America, South America, and then they connected, we got things like terror birds in South America. So, there will be evolution of dinosaurs, and we'll put the twins, but, you know, Um, 
feels great to clean and exhale. Okay. Horses. And so, so these kind of horses are here. And the whole culture of the Plains Indians with horses actually came from the reintroduction of horses. So horses were wiped out in North America, but then the limits of the forest horses escaped and they were redomesticated. The only thing about here is, so here we have this connection here, water rather than land. It's so the same way this causes interchange for land, it causes division for water. Okay? And so, <coughs> you see all these sister pairs of trim and other things, okay? that are separated now, you should be able to change genes you know, through the land barrier if you don't. Have you know this connection the limb animals go through and animals, but it blocks off marine animals. They have the features of alpha speciation elements. Okay, now the idea is in ecology mostly, but now it's been you know is used as an analogy in evolution as island biogeography. This is a great example of dynamic equilibrium in biology. So what does this plot mean? Um, so yes. here's the rate of extinction or migration. Here's the migration, the depletion, and the number of species. So what does the green line mean? More species, and black one. Yep, exactly. This is just this equilibrium, right? When it cross, it's each rate equals the immigration rate. Right? So it's not that each rate immigration rate is zero. Then it will fluctuate. Um, so that it will you know, wipe out all the species that are in this right? So it's up and down. But it's the first thing that this tool is valuable. So, what are you trying to do? If individuals are being something they're having as many offspring as they can, right, and having the right to adulthood. And if it causes everything else to go extinct, yeah. Right? I don't, I don't say, okay, oop, you know, I'm going to disrupt the balance of my life, let's stop breeding right now. No, I'm in the cell that should just continue. So, it happens to the For example, that actually is cancer. Right? So, what's cancer? Cancer is evolution. Right? So, you have some cells that break the desk. You have some cells that mutate, right? And then they happen to escape control by your body, right? And those that happen to have more offspring are more frequent, right? And then they mutate some more, and those that have more offspring still, you know, become more frequent. And so it's spreading and spreading and spreading through natural selection. Now the end is going to kill you, right? And have no offspring. It's a dumb thing to do. It would be better for it in the long term to not kill you and just have, you know, most of those genes passed on through your germline. I doesn't know what's happened to happen, which is being selected for having more and more and more and we're finally dead. So that's the natural selection. It's not going towards anything, it's just individual level selection. Good questions. Okay. And these plots to show how if your 
for the weight from islands, so you can sure it's lower. Um, and if your island's smaller, it's sure. Right. And so those just affect the weight of the small and the is not. And your island has to be too far out. That means that the island is more too far out. Okay? <coughs> and so this doesn't look to explain a lot of ecology, right? So Dan Simberloff is famous for many things. One of his things was covering small little islands off, off the coast of Florida um, with um, basically exterminator tents, right? And first, first counting all the species there, killing, killing all the octopod species, the tent off, and waiting to see what happened, right? And you get a different assemblage of, of insects back, but the same, they get, get about the same number. Right? So it shows this is not just, you know, you don't just pick a number at random from the uniform distribution, it's some sort of equilibrium based on the island. And it was based on distance to the mainland and also area. Okay? <coughs> and so it does work for ecology. We have the same idea for in terms of evolutionary time too. Okay? So maybe you expect more species on bigger land masses and smaller mass land masses. And so this model here possibly includes no speciation. It's all immigration, it's not speciation. We add speciation then it becomes more of an evolutionary context. Any questions about that? <coughs> okay, so here's another example of a five year pattern. Wallace is lying in other lines. Okay, so here we have the most flipping of islands. Right? And yet we see, and so you might think, okay, I'll have some people go here, some people go here, some people go here, some people go here, some people go this way. Right? Actually, we don't. We see this this jump population of some things, you know, like other things, like over here, and over here, right? and over here, and over here. Right? And they're all living in the island with this barrier that we do not. And Wallace, we're going to observe this pattern. Okay? And what we're going to do now is, um, in the ice ages, Connected, right? so it's like, it's like okay? So we could walk from here to here, or from here to here. Okay? But we need to keep channels here that we never bridge by land. So instead of the land is here, then we would cross these lines if I wanted to support it. Okay? So I'm riding a raft, or swimming, or if you're very lucky. So, <coughs> and that's when you can it. It's pretty cool to see these one of the times you look at one of them and see why, you know, how time has changed, how the geography has changed, and it's crazy. It doesn't function with things moving around, so it's like why are they coming down? Okay. <coughs> okay. Human dispersal is a great example of biogeography. Right? So we evolved in the old world, right? Africa and then spread out across Eurasia as well. When did we first get to North America? Right? That's a good question. And so we keep from the English, from Siberia to Alaska. <coughs> and then this shows all the evidence for um, the word in Siberia. And this is something that's a very active area of research. And so one question was, did people sort of walk them all this way, or were they going to go to the coast? It's still a very active area. Um, was it one invasion or was it multiple invasions? Okay. This is a very key biogeographic question for the us. Now it's a bit of a different perspective. Similar sort of questions there. So phylogeography. Right? So here's a, here's a phylogeny. Okay? Um, fishes, reptiles, birds, animals, and so forth. I can zoom in into your species and animals. Okay? And if I zoom in further, they go from tree structure to branching structure, to this network structure. Right? So 
you know, humans and bonobos, we don't exchange genes, right? It's a nice pyramid structure, right? But it's possible some in this class have ancestors that are common for some genes and other genes have different ancestors, right? And so we have this mixing, this network, okay? And so, <coughs> biogeography, the biogeography is often at this scale. Biogeography is often at this scale, species are being pictured by species, okay? Where this, where this branching can matter. So questions might be, you know, where were, th where were things species during the last ice age? Were there things in Tennessee? If they weren't in Tennessee, where were they? In the refugia in Florida and Texas, or just in Florida? Okay. Um, what's dispersal like on the California coast for sea urchins? Okay. Right, so there's ocean currents that come in and then split and go north and south. Does that introduce a barrier for gene flow? Or do we have gene flow across that, across that split? Okay. Those sort of questions are involved in biogeography. Um. <coughs> and so, for example, with the UV, UV is, you know, often the network diagrams of phylogeny of species. Right? So, here I sample, you know, my particular species, in this case, the two fish, right? So, this, and then I just put this. Okay. You make each line here and then one chain. And the approach that was classically used for this is then called nested clade analysis. Okay. <coughs> and so what you do is you lump in with the clades. So bigger clade, and then bigger clade, and so forth. Okay, it's very simple. And then what you do is you use that information and look it up in this table. Okay. So you can't read it, but basically it's a it's an economist key, basically. These are X. Yes, go to step two. If no, it's no. Okay? And this is kind of fun because you can do it, it's easy, it's fast. Right? So we go through, you find, you know, yes, it's a good gene flow dispersal, but it's some long distance dispersal, but in too many areas. Okay? So we get this very precise estimation of what's been happening. Just using a simple key, using a single gene. It sounds awesome, right? And so there's been software written to make it easy to use or automate this. So you just put in your tree, it'll tell you. 10,000 years ago on a Tuesday, it was long as this person, from here to here. Yes, that's interesting. So why do animals move more on Tuesday? Um, it's not quite that precise, but you get the idea. Okay. <coughs> and so it's very popular, probably with hundreds of citations. Okay. The problem was, it was never tested. Right? So here's something that seems like it would work, and we show on some empirical data sets, look, it makes sense, but that's it. Okay. So, um, Knowles and Madison in 2002, this came out in the 90s. Now in 2002, they actually started testing it. I was like, okay, let's make a population history. Okay. Um, and here it shows, here's a species history, okay. and here's a gene tree. Right? So if you think of, you know, a species of great apes, right? You just got one mitochondrial gene in great apes. And that's how you have to match the species tree? No. Disagree. Right? I disagree for many reasons. Through hybridization, things like that. But if we just have sort of basic allocatory and no hybridization, we go with things like the really two copies here, right? The set, right? Some of you are having, uh, think about bug blood groups, right? There's A and B and O, right? Well, chimps also have A and B. Right? So that means that you know, your A gene is no related to their A gene and to my E gene. You can say it's different alleles, it's in gene. Okay. <coughs> and so that's sort of this um, variation persisted through this speciation okay, so, because of, so if I did a phylogeny, I might say that, yeah, if you're not people who said chimpanzees in your art to me. Right? Just like you know, this one will persist to this one and this one this one. Right. If you use a lot of genes, you can sort of correct for this. Right. Using a single gene, you can get this issue. So these things would need to happen. Okay. Um, <coughs> for example, let's say, try to have a few ones that you add some pockets that are in many. And you can add a refuge, one refuge here, one refuge here, one refuge here. 
you can see what each of these hypotheses. Okay. And they did something similar, a different model, so four attacks on trade, and create nested trade analysis and other approaches. Okay. And found, for example, um, um, so how often is it accurate? And so, yep. Here's an abstract of study, and here's the input message. And see, how does that help you simulate the data? Okay, so it just doesn't work. All right, so you say, okay, I simulate under a model where you have allopatric speciation. And it says, oh, yep, dispersal. Sometimes. I might say alpha speciation sometimes. Okay? So it's doing a very, very bad job of estimating the natural processes. Okay? And also give you the answer without confidence intervals. So you just say, you know, you'd ask it, what's the answer? It would say, this. How confident are you? The answer is this. Okay. And there's no error bar going. Okay. <coughs> and so it's been shown to be a bad method. Okay. Even so, people still use it a lot. And so when you're an empiricist, you can go out and say, okay, I want to use this method. I want to figure out the biogeography. What's the answer? And you might use a method like this. And that's just, you know, this particular case. But we see the same sort of thing happening across biology. Right? Where someone proposes a method, never tests it, and it's popular. Okay, so it's your job as a technical scientist to figure out, can I really believe what this is telling me? Which is what they found did. Well, what can you do? Okay. Um, so one thing these authors, well, this one else has done, is <coughs> um, look at multiple gene trees and give you the common answer that they give you. And what you can do is say, okay, if it's, I have two hypotheses. It could be this model or this model. Let me see which model the gene trees is. Okay. And then say, okay, 70% of the gene trees prefer this model over that model. That you can do more sort of analyses than that and get ideas of uncertainty. Other things you can do with this, with these sort of phylogenetic phylog phylog questions, um, I don't need to worry about. <coughs> so we have the difference between a little bit of a and we see. So one question I have is, does this mean that black sea bass can sort of cross here somehow? But this is a can cross? And this is what we look at actually the Panama. But actually, there seems to be a certain thing here. So based on if you have like a single split right here, it's unlikely that there's the most recent coming in says you can use to just that split. Well, I'm going to just converge. And so, if this distribution is possible, at least in the ancestry, even if they have this exact same converge time, which is that sort of thing. So, you can do anything you want to do. Does this make sense? Yeah? Um, Imagine here is my population history. Right? Here's the present. Here's where they split. Right? And I said for two individuals from each. What could have happened? Well, I could have had these two shared a common ancestor here. Right? 
or it could have been back here, right? Or it could even have been way back here, right? Let's assume. These two are here. Okay. And this relates to who would about coalescence in evolution? Okay. So basically, imagine you have a population that has multiple individuals. Like sample just two. Okay. And imagine the same population going back in time. So here's the current generation, and here's the previous generation. What's the chance that these two individuals share share a parent? Well, this would have some parent, right? This would have a parent at random, and there's some chance that we need this one, and some chance that we need some something else. Right? And then we share they share the same parent called coalescence, right? right? What's not? Chance does Now that's what Okay? So you can see if we have a bigger population, the amount of time to have the same parent by chance should go up. Right? If we have just two parents of populations, the potential chance of having the same parent. Right? With a thousand parents, much lower chance. Okay? And so actually we can first think about population size from looking at how quickly these things coalesce with these two individuals. If it's very short coalescence, maybe it's a small population. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me see if you look here. Okay. But now imagine we're here, and uh, this one, and this one. Okay. We could have coalesced just at that spread. Right? In which case, the age of this split equals the age of the population split. Did that have to have happened? Nope. We could have gone many generations. Until we call us. Right? So the age of the split could, could the age of the age of velocity could, could predate the split by quite a lot. Okay? And that's what that figure is trying to get at. Now, the trick is it's possible that for some of them the split is actually different. Right? It's possible that this species can disperse well, but this species can disperse really well. So this split is a lot more recent. Okay? And so, the things in Panama, we think that deep water animals um, stop dispersing sooner than shallow water animals. Okay? And so, we have different patterns here. So, how do you tell this from this to this? That's hard. So, you develop models and you develop the data. Okay? Does that make more sense now? All this really starts discussion about bottlenecks, right? So, how can you pick up a bottleneck? Well, if many genes all share a common ancestor comes up here. Right? So this gene's that way, and the other gene also pulls it back here. It suggests then that you have a small population size. Right? So they're inferring while next to time. Okay. Um, what else can we do? Well, we can also figure out where species are dispersing from. Okay. So, here is um, a plot, and I'm looking at where it was first from the time. Okay. So we have estimate. Okay. And eventually, what you can do is then reconstruct how it's spread. So if it's originating in a certain area, right? you put in more of these sort of ways. And if that's what you do, you construct the changes and the sort of history process. Okay. So it seems to be they're 
talk to me about how they spread through the landscape. The links of phylogeography is looking at invasive species. Right? So here are Argentine mints. So, um, I was just say, okay, oh, well, if we knew that they're being transported primarily by you know, air travel, we could then restrict air travel from there. So, it lets, lets us actually take ecological steps to fix things, right, using this phylogenetic information. Okay. Um, <coughs> questions about this? So, we can think of other questions that relate to phylogeography. What, what, what scale question would we be curious about? Or biogeography at this point, too. Now, if we propose research in this sort of area, what could it be? So you could do phylogeo. So one question is: climate's changing. Things have to move to keep up with their climate, right? That they prefer. Well, how fast have they moved in, in the past? So you use phylogeography and see: okay, post glaciation, how quickly did things move up from refugia and fall along the glaciers retreating? How fast was that? And do we find out that to track their optimal climate now requires moving 100 times that speed? It might be in trouble. When it requires moving one tenth of that speed, eh, climate change is fine. Maybe not for other reasons. But it might suggest that they won't be dispersal limited in the fall of falling their climate. Right, good. Yeah. What else can you do? And I saw you try to get a PhD in this area, so you should have an idea of what you can do with it. So, right, just looking at like, okay, what's the history of dispersal and parents? You can actually look, look at like, the rates and see how they're different. What you're saying, right? So, is it possible that things with wings disperse faster than things without, without wings? Okay. Is it possible that dispersal rate is not actually so? You might think that you know, as island distance grows, dispersal rate drops. Does it drop linearly? Does it drop faster than linearly? Right. But if it affects how we disperse, we imagine if it's far enough. And you have all these rare events that could happen. Like you couldn't have tornadoes and like hurricanes and like that that drop up a lot, lot, lot faster than if they were closer. So not, not as big a process. And so you ask questions about those sort of rate correlations. Does that make sense?
speak up. Wait, what? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, the same way we've looked at the extinction rate versus time, or speciation rate versus time. Now, I think only I've actually looked at dispersal rate versus time. That'd be a great question to look at in many groups. Yeah. I was going to think anecdote. So Darwin was curious about dispersal of plants across water, salt water. And so he filled his bathtub with salt water and put a bunch of seeds in there. And then periodically takes them out and try to plant them, see how long they could survive in salt water before they still germinate. You know, like empirical way as the best to get dispersal. And then actually his butler. Put them in the water. What else do you get? Any questions? These questions? These techniques. What other questions are in scope? And you don't have to have a solution on how to, how to estimate things. Like, what, what, what sort of thing would be interesting for evolutionary biology here? And like we get that, I was going to be pretty passive very interesting too. I mean, like Hawaii, right? How, what's the order in which things got to Hawaii? And does that affect, you know, which things became tree like, which things didn't? You know, sort of thing. So that's cool. And also, I just said, you know, comparing animals and plants for dispersal rates. Maybe small animals work like seeds. Like small beetles get up to bird feet as well as the seeds do. But, you know, elephants don't. Cool. What else? There's pre-meds here. I know there's pre-meds here. It's okay. How could you use this stuff in med in medicine? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So bird flu is sweeping through. Did it come from, you know, chickens in Hong Hong Kong? Did it come from from in mainland China? Um, are people are they being dispersed through airports or the people in cruise ships? Yep, same sort of biogeographic questions you can address using those. Yeah, good. Uh, I mean, yeah, looking at, well, I mean, yes, yeah, so they try to figure out where it came from and how it spread and, like, you know, what the vectors bring into North America and that sort of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's actually, actually used a lot, it's important. Other questions? Other things you could do with this? Those of you who care about you know, delineating species, okay? so this sort of same sort of thing of, you know, is there a gene flow between populations? Can you say, is there a gene flow between my two potential species? Okay? Is there, you know, if chimps and bonobos are exchanging genes a lot across the Congo, maybe then they're one species, right? But they never do. I haven't done it for 100,000 years, so they're different species. Good. All right. Thank you all. Does this room work okay? Does it look better than the other room? <laughs>